So, uh, first of all, I guess I'll say um, straight up front that um, I feel a little bit intimidated <laughs> to be talking to all of you because um, I'm, I'm not a, a technical specialist. I guess you would call me a subject matter expert. Um, I'm an expert in my domain. Uh, by no means an expert in how to do any of this stuff. So I can see the value in it and um, I guess that's what drives me forward. So that's the first thing I'll say. I apologise if it's not technical enough for you. But perhaps you'll see um, how it is that regular people can can um, engage with vocabularies and, and use them to actually produce um, uh, something of value for the department. So I'm a user, uh, user researcher, a quantitative user researcher and came into my, the user research team um, and they said, oh, can you please just give us some insights from our, our spreadsheets and they gave me a whole bunch of spreadsheets and none of them were all, they all measured different things and talked about the same thing in different ways and um, there was no standard. Um, I did used to work in metadata management and so of course the very first thing I did was I thought, oh, <laughs> I need to make some standards apply here. And then um, I need to find a way to actually get all that. So they, they use qualitative data. So they're talking about videos and photos and handwritten notes. And I need to somehow make a way of um, making this discoverable uh, and searchable. So the best way for me to do that is, of course, to take my unstructured data and, and make it structured. And by unstructured data, I really do mean incredibly unstructured, not, not just data that isn't in an architecture, I mean stuff sitting around in space. So the problem that we're trying to solve, uh, that I'm trying to solve right now is that I've got a lot of research artifacts. I need to um, make them discoverable. Uh, we are working in, in an environment where people need uh, uh, us to be able to provide them with some insights very quickly. So uh, being able to actually search something is, is crucial. Um, the research data itself that we create is not reusable or able to be reanalyzed because um, it's all qualitative data and essentially the analysis is sitting inside the person's brain. Um, I have a particular passion for ontologies and so um, I can see that, that if I can actually look at the links between the things in people's brains then um, I can perhaps help them to understand how it is that they're actually um, doing things in a much more ordered fashion. So uh, this is just something I, I sent out to the people I was trying to convince that we needed to make a library. So we, we decided to make a, a, a research library. Um, we decided to order and structure the research. That's a very difficult thing for the qualitative researchers to do because what they're doing is a creative process. So mostly they're concerned that I will um, stomp on their creativity So <laughs> with, my, with my order. Um, and, and, and whatnot. So uh, we're trying to make it very usable and I'm doing a lot of user research and making it user-centered um, but at the same time trying to meet with certain standards and, and whatnot. So the stuff that goes into the library, uh, research notes, audio, video, photos, um, some demographic data which um, you know we, we pull out a lot of data all the time and reanalyze it uh, from you know data.gov.au or from the ABS uh, and, and then once it's um, been used for a, a particular purpose, it's then discarded. Um, it would be nice if we could actually store that somewhere. Um, we've got completed artifacts of research, um, so obviously the reports that are produced, and also we've got uh, some raw data. So we're creating data collection tools based on the vocabularies that we're creating uh, to enable the researchers to input their observations in a way that's actually standardised. So for example, they might note that a person speaks a particular language and in the past they would have just made some kind of note um, in whatever way they wanted to make it. They might have written down Italian or they might have written down uh, Fiorentino or something like that. Um, but the way that uh, we're producing forms for them so that they can type in IT and it automatically brings up the ABS um, Australian Standard um, Language Classification data. So that, that just makes it easy for them to, to meet standards. Um, then the complexities of creating a library of, um, of, of data about people is that um, uh, we've had difficulty doing it because we can't purchase, um, there's no library platform that we're allowed to buy. Uh, Department of Human Services doesn't support um, 
purchasing of any library platforms that exist in the cloud. Um, where we could use it in the cloud, the cloud needs to be in Australia. Um, it's very difficult to even get that. Um, there are obviously legislative requirements ar around uh, records management, but in addition, on top of that, we've got the um, uh, the National um, Human uh, Human and Medical Research Council's uh, guidelines that we also need to adhere to, so there's um, ethics considerations. Uh, and obviously, every single person has a different level of consent that they, that they um, complete. When they do a consent form, they'll tell us what, what they're consenting to, and so each individual person that we're tracking um, may have a different level of consent. So that, that creates complexity. Um, Essentially, creating discoverability requires a well thought out and robust structure to support it, and that's that's why I'm sitting here today talking to you now. So, what we're doing is uh, we this is a list for me to tick off essentially. So we're working out a draft taxonomy. So how are we describing? What are we observing? Um, all of the so we're, I've, we've actually done this as a, a, a whole of government project. So user research is done across many different government departments, and so we have 16 different agencies that we're working with um, who are doing user research and are um, creating um, research and qualitative. They have qualitative data that they need to store, and, and none of them are really sure how to do it. So we're working out a taxonomy, and that taxonomy needs to incorporate all the different things that the different departments are doing. Um, we're then having each of the members go through and, and do a qualitative um, ass uh, an assessment of ha have we, how have we gone with describing this thing. So if we're describing, for example, um, a service, uh, if I've described it in my way, are you happy with, does that meet your needs as well? Um, and I'll show you in, in a moment what my DAGI spreadsheet looks like um, in relation to that. Um, and obviously they're making additions or changes or suggestions. So we're doing that in an ontological way so that we can, um, because in recognition of the fact that it's most likely that I'm going to need to have. Mm. Hello? Hello? Hello, Bridget. We can hear you fine. Oh, someone was, was trying to talk, I think. Um, anyway, uh, so we're also at the same time checking existing vocabulary. So we've been using, um, obviously, uh, the Research Vocabularies Australia. Uh, last night, for example, I was watching TV and at the same time going through Research Vocabularies Australia and trying to find things that had already been defined. Um, that's a long process that we're currently sitting on on around about 1,200 individuals um, that we're putting into the taxonomy. Uh, once we've done that, we're then going to look at existing properties in ontologies. If we've already, you know, if there's a URI already in existence for something that's already been described um, and is out there in the world, we would like to obviously reuse that rather than use our own. Where um, where it might be broader or narrower than what we're looking at, where we're noting that and um, and obviously putting into um, my Jackie spreadsheet, um, you know, we've chosen not to use that one because it doesn't quite meet the right definition. Um, where something's not necessarily open um, or, or where something's not necessarily uh, defined with a URI, but um, may have a data source that we would like to connect to. Uh, for example, a lot of the ABS data um, obviously has there's a, a large bank of, um, there's a, you know, they have their data spine that they're creating. Um, it, it makes sense for us to connect to that rather than perhaps connecting to something else that's out there in the world that might meet our needs, but, um, but if we can, uh, if, we, if the ABS one is, um, has an existing data set behind it, we can consider what we're defining and work out whether or not we could use the ABS one rather than using the one that's out there in the world, in which case we might create our own new URI um, for a, a term. Um, obviously, we need to have a look and see, once we've, we've worked out what already exists in the world, then we need to look at what needs new definitions or, or um, if we actually make an entirely new vocabulary. Um, and that's what we're, we're hoping that we might be able to um, pop that up onto, um, onto the research um, vocabularies Australia database so that, so that others can use it as well. So we do, as I said, we've got 16 different agencies, but it, 
there's more than just 16 different agencies that are doing user research at the moment. So once we've done that, that's sort of when, when we get to the end of what I know what to do. And so then I call Nick and go, okay, I, <laughs> I think I've got my list now. And I, I think we've, we've worked out what we're going to do and we've worked out what the definitions are. Can you help us with actually going and doing the thing and, and making, um, making it into an ontology? So um, that, that's when I'll be calling Nick. Um, so, in terms of uh, working with other government agencies, we can't ever put our libraries together at the moment because legislation doesn't allow that. Uh, there is the capacity to create uh, consent forms that where a person has said, yes, you can share across government, uh, in which case we could actually create a whole of government user research library. Um, there's two benefits to that. One is we do work together with other departments. Uh, so Department of Human Services, for example, are always working with other government departments on different projects. Uh, because user research is part of the digital service standard, everyone needs to do user research when they're creating something that is a digital platform now. If we can actually interrogate our libraries and know that your library is the same as my library when we're looking at things that we've defined, then that will help us to pull out insights much quicker. Um, the other thing we can do is if we can actually create a whole of government user research library, then uh, we'll have enough data that we could actually have a look and see whether or not um, the patterns that our current researchers are applying are actually uh, represented in the data. So at the moment, um, uh, you know, people are using, the, the people who are doing the, the work, the researchers are uh, anthropologists and um, ethnographers. They all have, um, you know, a lot of experience in the field, but they're still relying on what they intuitively see as the patterns. Um, it would be great, I think, to actually be able to use a, a large data set to actually look at it um, and say, well, well, who are these people really and what are the things that are really connected? Um, and, and that's a really big part of the work that I would like to get to in the end. Um, user research relies very heavily on uh, two different things. One is personas and the other is archetypes. So a persona is saying, here's an example of a person who is um, of that particular cohort that you're interested in. Um, and, and we're saying that that's representative of, of that particular cohort, but we don't really know for sure because we haven't ever got the data together to actually look at that. The other thing we use are archetypes. Now, um, if I uh, if I wanted to use myself as an example um, of, of an archetype, uh, I'm a 42-year-old woman and I have two children. Um, Facebook uh, uses an ontology to, um, to represent, you know, work out what ads it's going to display to me and, and what things it thinks I might be interested in. And, you know, quite frankly, the things that Facebook presents me with are not always things that I'm actually interested in. And I suspect that that's um, because the patterns that they're using aren't always representative of me. So I think it would be great if we could actually um, look at the, the archetypes that we use in government. So, for example, we use um, an archetype of or a cohort, for example, of um, uh, an Indigenous person and we might uh, represent them in a certain way and I think it, that might not actually be how things really are in real life. Um, so I'm really excited and interested to see what the library can do to help us understand people better. Um, so this work needs to be done in DHS and uh, it, it's something that needs to be done in a, whole of, a broader whole of government. So it's, uh, it's just a piece of work that we're working on very slowly. None of us have any money to do this work. We're just doing it in our spare time because we all feel that it's worthwhile. So um, the way we're doing it, uh, this is my um, daggy whiteboard <laughs> uh, where we started. And um, so the thing about this project that's quite different for um, for us is that we're, what we've discovered is we've got two different domains. So we've got the domain of government and um, the services that we use. And so obviously a gift is, um, is, is something that we're using a lot to, to de describe that. But we're also, we have this domain of uh, the user or the person. Um, and what we're interested in is how they interact with us. And so the things that are of interest there, you can see a lot of them are already represented in ABS data. So income distribution quite clearly has a standard that we can apply to that. Um, but other things such as um, biases um, are, are something that's not really mapped very well, um, certainly in government. There is the Behavioural Bias Codex. 
So we've used that one, for example, we've loaded that into our um, architecture. Um, when we're, so this is obviously very, very much from a Department of Human Services perspective, but when we're looking at how people interact with us, we're finding that their environment and their social, social and their personal um, aspects of their life are, are really core to how they're interacting with us. So we're having to define those things. Uh, so the challenge for that, of course, is, um, as I said before, is trying not to destroy the creative process. And so, um, as I said before, we've been loading, um, we've been creating data collection tools for researchers. And um, uh, talking to a, a professor at the at um, UCLA uh, on Sunday, uh, she tells me that that's quite groundbreaking. Um, that hasn't really been done before, uh, which is interesting to me. Um, but anyway, she's she started to do it for her uh, research, and um, and she thinks it's a, a great idea to create um, just some things that we know researchers are, are noting, and um, and and use the language, you know, use standards to um, to sort of automatically input the stuff for them. So we've been talking to ABS, for example, to say how we how should we word this question. And, and um, what, what are the standards that we can sort of insert in there? So, for example, DHS has a different idea of what disability is to the ABS, and so we've sort of worked through that and decided that we will define a payment, and one of those payments might be disability support pension, but we'll also define disability, and we use the ABS version of disability, and that allows me to actually connect the ABS data on disability with DHS data on people who are on a disability support pension, um, and so that's a fabulous thing to be able to do. So we're creating a three-tiered library essentially so that we can uh, create the environment that meets records management standards. Um, so we've got, uh, and obviously meets the consent um, forms, uh, so we've got a, a space that's just for the researcher that has all of the identifiable data that we have completely locked down. Then we've got um, a space where the vocabulary sits, which is in um, a space that's, that's accessible by um, the team or hopefully across government eventually and then we've got um, the, the third sort of part of the library which is where all the, the big reports go and where we've done some analysis where we put um, that analysis. Uh, I thought this would be more interesting to you guys. <laughs> so I don't normally show the qualitative researchers this, but um, this is a bit of an example of um, how we're looking at the modelling. So we've been, um, one of the data collection tools we're creating is one on digital literacy because there's no standard, well there's actually no way of um, measuring digital literacy in Australia uh, at the moment and uh, so I've pulled information from the UK and from um, the EU and created a survey for people to take out to the field and, and actually um, get the people to fill out um, and of course um, each of those questions has a taxonomy behind it and um, so we've modelled that there. I don't know if you can, that's probably, I don't know how to make it bigger. Um, can't, oh, my mouse is too fast. Uh, <laughs> sorry, I don't know how to make it bigger, but I can I can send it to you. We're still working on it, clearly. Um, actually, this is the user domain, and I've been working on that for the past couple of weeks. So, uh, working on the leveling of, of this, and so it's, it's quite substantially different from what it was. Um, I had lots of internal um, questions with myself about whether or not opening a business is a service event because we're thinking about it from a government perspective or, or, or not, and other sort of little um, struggles with, with self. But anyway, it uh, just shows you where we're up to. So we, it really is just a taxonomy at this stage. Uh, once we've actually worked out what the links are between the things, then of course we can start looking at coding it um, as an ontology. So. I think that's about all. Um, I did put on there some thanks. Uh, there are lots of people who've been helping us, obviously. Um, as I said, I'm not a specialist by any stretch of the imagination. So we've had DHS metadata management and ontologies team have been going through our DAGI spreadsheets and helping us, which has been fabulous. Um, our internal uh, data architecture teams have also been helping us um, to, to link the internal MI with our external 
qualitative data set. Nick has been helping me. Um, Department of Health have been going through and uh, looking at who owns what, uh, which has been very useful. Um, obviously, some people in in the community, I've, I've made a whole of government um, working group, uh, user research libraries community, and some people there, like there's um, one individual in particular who um, just is really passionate about it, and so he sends me emails at all kinds of times of the night, um, thinking about levelling and whatnot. Um, Rosette has been giving me some great advice, like don't um, don't make an ontology of the entire world, um, and of course. Each of the government departments themselves have been providing us with their daggy spreadsheets, and you know they're all feeling very embarrassed about that. But I'm like, it's fine. We've all got daggy spreadsheets, and if we put them together, then we can we can sort of work through how we what we're calling things and uh, why and um, how we might like to define them. So um, yeah, so that's 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 it.